Uh, my name's Rob Evans and today's the 4th of May 2015 and I'm delighted to be talking to Brian Anderson about his memories, reflections and thoughts on a very distinguished 50 year uh, career in control systems. So Brian, thank you for talking to us today. My pleasure, Rob. Um, I guess the logical place to start is tell us what you're doing now and also your, th your memories about your early days, university, oh, going to Stanford, those early days. Well, uh, now I'm a professor at the Australian National University and a researcher in National ICT Australia. Oh. I'm part-time and I'm pretty close to retiring. <laughs> uh, but I started my life in Sydney and I did most of my growing up in Sydney, a little bit in London and uh, Brisbane and uh, then entered Sydney University. And in Sydney University, I studied uh, mathematics and electrical engineering. Um, to get the equivalent of a Dean's Award in electrical engineering, you actually had to study a lot more science, mathematics and physics, okay. than uh, for a, a normal degree. And th that was the route that okay. uh, I okay. went. Okay. Okay. And you're clearly a, an outstanding mathematician. Um, the, is the engineering part of the Dean's Award or you had also a passion for engineering or? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I think from high school days, uh, I was very interested in maths and physics. And I used to play with an electric train set and electric motors mm -hmm. and uh, uh, TV, repair TVs, and so I acquired some engineering interest. And I had two close school friends whose fathers were electrical engineers, and I admired them both very much. One actually was chairman of electrical engineering at Sydney Uni. Okay. And I think uh, my hobbies and my friendship with these boys and knowledge of the, the parents whom I admired shifted me towards electrical engineering away from maths. Okay. And in, in thinking about it a little bit more, I do think that engineer, that mathematicians are, as a class are a bit more inward looking yes. than perhaps my personality is and I was more comfortable with a more outward looking personality of engineers. So you ended up going to Stanford, Brian. Can you tell us about that? Yes. Um, I, saw, I did do, do want to do graduate work and I sought advice from the father of the school friend who by now was Dean of Engineering at University of British Columbia okay. in Vancouver and he said definitely go to the United States, mm -hmm. pick one of Stanford, Berkeley, MIT or mm -hmm. Caltech. Fairly safe options. <laughs> yes, so I, I wrote to them and um, some professors at uh, Sydney University agreed to be referees and then one of these professors said to me one day, I think I can get you a research assistantship at Stanford. And what was going on was there was a Stanford faculty member, Robert Newcomb, who was on a sabbatical in Australia and he'd met uh, the Sydney University professor mm. and uh, received a sales pitch about myself and uh, 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 agreed to at least meet me. I don't think he'd agreed at that stage to a research assistantship. Anyway, I met uh, Bob Newcomb and he actually gave me a small problem to work on, which I solved. And then he said, uh, really, I believe I can fix for you a research assistantship at oh, Stanford. Wonderful. So it was a very fortuitous and wonderful mm -hmm. thing. I was so fortunate uh, with that. And the environment at uh, Stanford in those days, this is around about... 64, 64 1964. Yeah. Can you tell us about that environment? Who else was there? Okay. Um, when I was in undergraduate school, yes. I'd used a number of textbooks and they were pretty well all American in origin and I arrived at Stanford and I saw the authors of half those <laughs> textbooks. <laughs> so I was in some kind of nirvana. Yes. And, and it is true that the excellence at Stanford is so pervasive mm. 
and general to the institution rather than confined to exceptional pockets, which was, I think, the case at, at, at Sydney University. Yes. That to move there from, from Sydney was an immense privilege. Yes, yes. And so uh, who were some of the people okay. around with you? And well, my own supervisor, uh, yes. Bob Newcomb, who's um, still an active professor yes. um, at the University of Maryland. And then in the systems area, Gene uh, Franklin, mm. uh, a very uh, famous person, Bernie Widrow, yes. uh, another one, uh, Arthur Bryson, okay. another one, and certainly Rudy Kalman. Yes. Rudy arrived uh, as a new professor at Stanford the same quarter that I started graduate study. Wow. And I had the experience of enrolling for uh, courses taught by Rudy in two successive, uh, two successive terms. Oh, that's fantastic. It was. And you, you with Bob Newcomb, I, and I remember studying his books at yes. university too in circuit yeah. theory. So you worked on circuit theory, but you had a very systems and control systems view of all that. Well, yes, I did work on, uh, on circuit theory with Bob. It was actually uh, a theory of time varying passive circuits. So okay. circuits where you had inductors and capacitors and resistors and transformers, but the element values could vary with time. Yes. And that was what my PhD thesis was about. The control, si my control systems interest at the time I left Sydney University was not that strong because I don't think the instructor that I'd had at Sydney University had been able to teach it in an exciting way and all the textbook was perhaps not as exciting. Yes. And what absolutely tipped the balance was attending the lectures by Rudy Kalman. Yes, I can imagine. It was a challenge to, to keep up with them and I enjoyed that challenge and was able to to handle it and of course as we all know he was at the absolute frontiers yes. of, of the discipline so it's very exciting to sit in on, on something like that and sometimes he'd be talking about the recent research and I'd say my move out of circuit theory into more generally control systems and system theory is as much due to Rudy Kalman okay. as, it, as it was to to uh, Bob Newcomb. And a lot of your work involves spectral factorization and things like that in, in your PhD. And I guess the, the move from Wiener filtering and all the spectral factorization issues, so you were right in the middle of that yes. move to differential versions of everything, which that, is, must have been very exciting. That's right. Um, there is a way of looking at classical passive network synthesis and of Wiener and even Kalman filtering and of linear optimal control yes. using this tool called spectral factorization. Yes. And I had different insights into spectral factorization from my own reading plus working with Bob on my thesis and with Rudy. Yes, yes. Yeah. I remember reading some of your stuff on that and it, I was struck by the fact that from that perspective you could see all those Yes, All those advances yes, in yes, one shot, yes, and it was yes. quite, quite a remarkable thing. There's one more thing I might mention that um, uh, I had a discussion with uh, Rudy one day about uh, an unfinished aspect of some work he had done, and he encouraged me to work on it, and I worked on it and uh, wrote up something as a paper, and he went through it and he tore that paper to shreds, <laughs> not from the point of view of the technical content, but the writing style. Okay. And, and I learned an enormous amount about technical writing, valuable stuff, Fantastic. from being put through the ringer by Rudy Kahn. <laughs> <laughs> and I suppose many others were also put through the ringer by, they were. by Rudy He's a Kahn. tough guy. And also in that, uh, you mentioned people like Bernie Widrow. So yes that exposure to that exciting beginnings yes. of adaptive systems yes. was all there for you too and uh... that, that's right he was a pioneer in the adaptive systems area yes. well before really 
uh, Narendra and Morse and, and uh, yes. Uh, yes. so on. Yes, yes. From, from, from a signal processing point of view. Of yes, course, yeah. yes, yeah. but your, uh, your uh, contributions have spanned signal processing, yes. control, yes. communication. Yes. So yes. it sort of all makes sense when you hear that, yeah. ba that yeah. background. Yes. And what did you do after you finished your PhD? Well, um, I stayed on at Stanford yes. as an assistant professor. Uh, and uh, simultaneously I continued where the part-time job I had in a company that I'd started uh, while I was still a student mm. called Vidar Corporation that later went into um, Ling Temco Vought, I think, and then TRW. Okay. Um, it, it was a, originally a startup done mm -hmm. by um, Stanford professor Malcolm McWhorter. Mm. Um, and then uh, after a year, I returned to Australia. Okay, okay. And why did you return? I mean, uh, you obviously, from that, from that jumping off point, yes, you could have had anything. Yes, yes. Well, um, there's no question that the the technical environment in America... We're glad you did, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> the technical environment in America, and in particular at Stanford, could not be bettered. Yes, no. But even in those days, I thought all other aspects of the life environment in which I was could be bettered by returning to Australia. Okay. Uh, I think it's a, a, a wonderful country. And, of course, I had friends and... and and relatives here. I've always considered myself yes. a sort of passionate Australian. And um, so it was a wish yes. to come back. Uh, I did want to obtain a position where I could have the sort of freedoms that I'd gotten used to at Stanford. I think there was a pattern in Australian universities at that time to overmanage junior faculty. And I would have found that uh, very, very constraining. So it wasn't a case of um, take any job in Australia. It yes. was a case of wanting to come to Australia, but it had to be the right sort of job. Yeah. And it was. It you, was. You came back as a full professor. Uh, yes, I came back as a department head. Yes. Um, and uh, in that, uh, of a small department, yes. but in that role, um, there were immense freedoms. Um, and there was the freedom to, to make some appointments and um, one thing I learned at Stanford um, that uh, was sourced if you like with Fred Terman, mm -hmm. a very famous engineer, electrical engineer of a past Was he generation. at Stanford? Yes he was. He, yes. He'd, he'd, he'd been provost of Stanford I think Yes, at the time right. I was there but you know earlier dean yes, of engineering and he'd helped Hewlett and Packard get started. Yeah. And, and I read some of the stuff he wrote and he said, what you must have is steeples of excellence in adjoining or reinforcing areas rather than have one person in control and you know, one yes. person in optical oh. electronics or something. If you're going to do control, you've got to have several people in control. Or if you're going to do optical electronics, you, you've yes. got to have several people. So uh, I'd, I'd acquired that lesson and I used it at Newcastle when uh, I was um, involved in making further appointments there. And, and so that explains, in a way, how you built a spectacular group at Newcastle. Fred Terman's responsible. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he gave a, an intellectual framework. Yes, yeah. yes. No, I appreciate yeah. that. So, Brian, you, uh, you built a spectacular group at Newcastle and uh, made some very strong appointments and it was a very productive yes. and exciting, technically yes. exciting period of your yes. life. Would you like to tell us yes. a bit about yes. that and reflect yes. on? Yes. Well, um, one of those was uh, John Moore, with whom I had um, a technical association and friendship over some decades. And um, he joined the University of Newcastle about a week or two weeks after me. Oh, wow. We'd um, more or less concluded the arrangement work, walking around the gardens of the Allerton Conference Centre of the University of Illinois. Okay, so you were both October. still in the US at that yes. time? Yes, he was at the University of Santa Clara. Okay. And um, 
let's also be clear that you were an early faculty <laughs> member <laughs> at, yes. at uh, Newcastle, Rob, and uh, yes, was Graham Goodman. Yes, and I'm was, very uh, grateful for that experience. A very yes. famous person. And um, anyway, uh, John and I um, clicked uh, very, very well technically. Mm. And uh, I think we were also motivated by the idea of book writing. Mm. And that was really very unusual in Australia. So we did a book on linear optimal control, mm. which um, of course drew very heavily on Rudy Kalman's work, but we'd uh, done some work in that uh, area ourselves. And uh, then uh, we put a lot of effort into studying uh, aspects of Kalman filtering and in particular smoothing. Mm. And um, uh, we'd become aware that uh, there were really no smoothing algorithms around which, for which stability had been proved and in fact most of them had internal instability through unstable pole zero cancellations. Yes. So with the graduate students and with each other, we did a lot of work on smoothing. And that, plus our knowledge of Kalman filtering, besides finding its way into, into papers, uh, was included in the book we wrote on optimal filtering, uh, which is, I think, much more widely cited than the book on uh, optimal linear optimal control. Mm. And it's cited by people like econometricians and, and not, not just people in, uh, in electrical uh, engineering. Yes, okay, okay. Uh, there's one other result that I really remember with uh, John Moore with um, a lot of affection almost. And uh, it concerns decentralized systems, mm. which of course are a big uh, mm. issue now. But you can imagine a system with two scalar inputs and two scalar outputs, a linear time invariant system, and you can imagine that you might be told to stabilize it because it's initially unstable with a controller that connects output one to input one and output two to input two. And there are examples of such systems for which it's impossible to find time invariant controllers mm. with this decentralized structure which will stabilize them. And what we were able to show was that for many such systems, you could have a periodically time varying controller and it would keep it stable. And I believe there's an analogy with many social systems, including systems in democratic countries, which remain stable because governments change. The controller. Well, that's a very interesting the, the controller connection. Being the, being the, well, it's a kind of far fetched, but nevertheless. Well, I think I think there's value in this because any one government has strengths and weaknesses, and if you leave them in place too long, the weaknesses can really eat away yes. at the institutions of the country and so on. And by changing governments or changing CEOs, yes. you, you get someone else or another team which has a different set of weaknesses. Yes, and so that's the a, old ones get repeated. That's a very interesting <laughs> insight. I do remember that paper well. Of course, it was a lovely paper. Yes. In that, uh, through that uh, time at Newcastle, you also kept up your circuit theory and wrote a rather beautiful yes. book. Yeah, well, that's nice of you to say that. Um, it was, so to speak, my first love. I don't know if you remember your first girlfriend, <laughs> but <laughs> circuit theory was my first love. And I wrote the book with uh, an outstanding um, student who mm. was originally from Thailand. And uh, I might say we've kept up our connection and he came to my 70th birthday party in Australia, Fantastic. which was uh. which was just uh, lovely. And the King of Thailand was presented with a copy of that. Uh, that Good book. heavens. And it's, it is widely cited today and I'm proud of it and remember the work with him with great affection. Yes, it, um, I, I uh, often look at that book too. Okay. I, I find it a remarkable book actually. Right. And, um, right. And uh, do you have any sadness that circuit theory and synthesis and all those areas are sort of very rarely taught in electrical engineering courses these days? It, it was a lovely development. Yes, but I don't have sadness. Um, 
life has to go on and part True. of life is <laughs> renewal, you know, and there's other exciting things I suppose. Have, 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 have come in their place. I'd have to say I am critical that in my undergraduate uh, engineering, electrical engineering course, there was so much attention given to vacuum tubes. Yes. And, and rather less, if you like, given to transistors. Yes. yes. And uh, life hadn't gone on enough yes. for the undergraduate course at Sydney Uni. Yes. Another result that I thought was remarkable from uh, your time at Newcastle was your output feedback work. Ah. <laughs> Do you have anything to say? <laughs> it was a tough area. Well, we should recall what it is, right? You've got uh, a linear system that's unstable, mm -hmm. and in general it's got multiple inputs and multiple outputs, and one is looking for a constant feedback law, mm -hmm. not dynamic but yes. static, that um, when put around the system will stabilize it and uh, there is no simple solution no. to that uh, problem but uh, what with Eli Jury and Neil Malbose we discovered was it was a special case treatable by a, a general theory that logicians had developed uh, particularly a fellow called Tarski, but mm. there was a mathematician called Seidenberg, um, that if you like provided a massive, massive generalization to Ralph Hurwitz's uh, okay. criteria. And um, you could answer the question, yes there is or no there is mm. not, a stabilizing feedback law. Yeah. And then with um, uh, ability to solve multivariate polynomial equations, if there was a feedback law, you could find one because okay. it was given as a real solution mm -hmm. of these multivariate polynomial equations. Um, the answer was depressingly technical. It wasn't. Yes. It wasn't a beautiful answer. No. It was a very technical answer. Nice to get the problem out of the way. It's true that many, many people looked at the problem and, and solved special cases. But I think that's the best you'll ever be able to do with that problem. Yes. Well, I recall a seminar which you expressed exactly those thoughts Did about I? 40 <laughs> years ago. Is it 40 years well, ago? Well, it's amazing. Your memory that, amazes um, me. Uh, where you uh, said that it was the problem was eating away at you and it was very, very hard. And, and you were looking forward to being able to solve it. And you solved it. <laughs> but your solution you found disappointing in a way. Okay. Which, and yeah. I remember you saying exact same words wow. that long ago. So you there you go. Me. So you're consistent. Okay, I'm glad. <laughs> it is a virtue. Yeah. And so, Brian, uh, um, you moved from Newcastle around 1980 or something. 82. 82. Yeah. And went to ANU. That's right. Which was then, in a sense, starting up a new department. Yes. Um, but uh, and, and, and another enormous flowering of your technical work in adaptive control and many other areas. So can you tell us a bit about the move to, new, to ANU? And ANU wasn't uh, so focused on engineering, so that must have been a challenge no. in itself. So um, I was the first engineering professor at um, the oh. ANU, and uh, they stuck me into a physics school and said, you're going to start a department of systems engineering and um, the physics school had some very traditional physicists within it, which is code for saying there were many physicists who didn't really imagine engineering had much to offer intellectually <laughs> and was, in intellectual terms, perhaps a pygmy next to the giant of <laughs> physics. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so um, there was, from some parts of the physics school, clear you know, hostility to um, to us because couldn't the money have been better spent on more physics? Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, y you can live with that because we were a self-contained entity. And um, as you are saying, I think, um, at that stage I started putting uh, a great deal of effort into adaptive control. Mm -hmm. And while I was still in uh, Newcastle, uh, working with uh, 
uh, Rick Johnson, mm. who's now at Cornell and doing other things, um, we'd established um, a sort of complicated condition to guarantee exponentially fast convergence and therefore robust mm. behavior in many cases of a number of uh, uh, adaptive control algorithms. Mm. Now, when I moved to uh, Canberra, shortly after I moved there, I heard a seminar by uh, a French person visiting in which he described uh, a laboratory setup using adaptive control in France which had exhibited massive misbehavior after about a week of operations. Mm, the thing had just gone on beautifully and then bingo. Um, Probably another an analogue to governments there as well. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And, and, and then I, I um, heard about such a phenomenon in some other place, I can't remember where. And then I, using an Apple II Plus computer, and in right. case you don't know what its memory was, it was 64K, <laughs> using an Apple II Plus computer in a language called BASIC, I had an idea of why this was occurring, and I simulated it at home, mm. and I got this behaviour after 45 minutes. And uh, that behaviour was explicable using the tools that I'd developed with Rick Johnson at, oh, wow. at, at Newcastle. And essentially, if you don't give enough excitation to an adaptive system, and the adaptive system's got an implicit or explicit identifier in there, in an insufficiently excited state, it will make a mistake mm. with the identification or the identified parameters will drift round. Mm. And you can drift to a region where you get instability yes. and so violent yes. oscillations. Um, so that was also, the, the notion of the persistency of excitation and the mechanism whereby unexpected oscillations could occur could really also explain what became known as the Roars or Roars Athens. Yes. Um, I think counterexample. They, yes. they asserted that no adaptive control uh, algorithm could work. Um, and uh, that was an incorrect uh, yes. assertion, of course. Uh, and uh, what they were really observing in their experimental work was what happened when there was an absence of persistency of excitation. Yes. Uh, there need to be some unmodeled dynamics and so on, along, you know, along with it too in their example, but it, it's essentially absence of persistency of excitation. And you're uh, a, a keen windsurfer, yes. whereas Queen went for a long time. So I guess that's where the name of the windsurfer approach came from. Uh, the windsurfer approach to adaptive control <laughs> certainly came from my thinking about how I'd learnt windsurfing. Yes. Um, and now I, I know I'm talking to one of Australia's ace windsurfers. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> Maybe no. you're a bit slower these days. Yes. But there is a, a process of learning where you can do certain things but you can't do the next stage. And you try doing the next stage and you fall over or you do it with great difficulty and gradually you master the next stage. And then you go on to the next stage beyond that and learn or fall or with great difficulty master it and then, and then so on. So you progressively, partly through experiment at the boundaries of your abilities, push out what your abilities are. It's the same really as learning tennis or mm. something like that. And the windsurfer approach to adaptive control em embodied a different approach to adaptive control and learning the numerator and denominator coefficients of yes. transfer function. Um, it, it involved learning uh, what was going on in the passband and gradually expanding the passband yes. and designing uh, and designing the uh, the controller accordingly. Yes, it's a very appealing approach, intuitively, yes. it makes yes. a lot of sense. And so. I really came, came at it through thinking about yeah. windsurfing. Windsurfing is a wonderful example it is. of adaptive control that is. in the that humans is. of the control. That is. 
Yes, and I wonder if there are lessons from, you hinted at it before, for, you know, way governments behave or stabilisation of, of uh, communities and societies. I wonder if there are also lessons from control back yes. into yes. and from, uh, you know, f both ways in, yes. in this type of thing. Yes. Yes. Um, er, sometime around this time, you also did quite a lot of industry work and you did work with Boeing and model order reduction work and things like this. Yes. Um, so just to mention what the, the Boeing work was, they were taking 200 person years to design the pitch control system for their commercial aircraft. Mm -hmm. And it took that time because essentially they had a trial and error method. And you might say, well, why couldn't they use linear quadratic control? And the problem was, if you use linear quadratic control, you got a controller that was about 60th order mm -hmm. because the plant was that sort of order. Yes. And no manager would agree to implementing a 60th order <laughs> controller, even if they had taken a course from Rudy Kerr. <laughs> um, yes. So Boeing were insistent on having a, a low order controller, which you could sort of get a feel for. Um, and so, uh, yes, that was the problem I worked on. And uh, I had a Boeing engineer with me for a year in Australia. And uh, it later gave rise to a bunch of papers. And I wrote a textbook with a Japanese um, professor mm. on a model and, a model and uh, control to reduction. He'd been a visitor with me for a year in Australia too, and that was his specialty in, uh, in Japan. Yes, I think this is a really important area because as you say, even in the days of lots of computation capability and everything else, in the end, if you end up with a higher order controller, <laughs> people, somewhere there are people involved and they don't understand no. it or it, it is much harder to implement than you think or something. Well, that's right. Um, in any time we implement a controller, we cross our fingers that the unmodeled mm. aspects are not going to bite us in the backside. Exactly. Um, and uh, if it's a 55th order controller, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's a, yeah, yeah. a big possibility for, for getting things wrong in terms of truncation yes, of, of exactly. uh, coefficients exactly. and, and, and the like. One of the uh, uh, big things that you got involved with in your time at um, ANU was becoming president of IFAC, the International yes. Federation yeah. of Automatic Control. Yes. And I think at the time you uh, got involved, it may be involved between 50 and 60 countries were represented on IFAC. Yes, was probably about 50, nearer 50, 50 than 50, 60. Yeah. Yes. I can't remember the exact number. But that must have been uh, quite a, 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 you know, a, a large job and um, yes, a um, leadership position yes, of some substance. Yes, I, uh, I served 12 years as an officer, which was the standard career trajectory for okay. someone uh, who was going to be a future president, the, the system. Um, brought you in, when, mm. knowing that you were going to be a future president, and you did that between your sixth and ninth year. Yes. Well, my first, um, I, I was also brought in with the injunction from the then, the then president that um, lots of things needed to be improved. And, okay. And that they were willing to give me uh, an unusual degree of latitude. And uh, my first, uh, task as an officer was to chair the technical board okay. of IFAC and the technical board prior to my involvement in it when it had a meeting would get bogged down in the discussion of dates <laughs> and maybe fees. It didn't really do anything technical. Mm. So with some very able vice presidents of the technical board whom I got on side, including Leonard Jung, yes. who was my successor as the chairman of the technical board three years later. Uh, we revamped what the technical board did. We put some structure 
around uh, the sequences of meetings, we got processes to evaluate the quality of the proposal, mm. we stopped focusing on dates, um, we got some feedback after, after meetings and then we started focusing on the publications. Having done something about the meetings, we started mm. focusing on the publications. At the time I became a vice president of IFAC and chair of the technical board, there was just Automatica. Okay. And now you would know there's a range of yes. IFAC uh, affiliated yeah. uh, journals. And sometime in this, um, during this uh, period, um, we also established agreements with the ACC, the European Control Conference, Latin American Control Conference, mm -hmm. and the Asian Control Conference to do things in conjunction with them, so to speak, which was a you know, very good move. And it, 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 it helped stop any evolution of an alternative yes. uh, uh, to IFEC. Um, one of the one of the challenges in those times, um, and the, the date's quite important, I became a vice president in 1984, the Soviet Union still existed, and uh, the upper level positions of IFAC were, so to speak, divided by arrangement between, uh, I'll call them East Bloc countries mm -hmm. and, and everybody else. And that meant that sometimes you didn't always get particularly able people, mm. you know, in the roles. And people would come to a council meeting and have an interpreter. Well, that, you, you really can't no. have a, an easy council meeting if people have got interpreters whispering in their ears. It stops a certain spontaneity and, yes. and uh, creativity of uh, deliberations. Uh, and, uh, and the people are unsure of themselves and so on. So, so that was an issue that, that okay. you know we had to had to deal with. Mind you, there are some there were some excellent people from those East Bloc yes. East Bloc countries, and Boris Tam and Tibor Vamos were two yes. presidents, and they were outstanding. But um, we had to have a large number of of people in senior IFAC positions from the countries and it sort of tailed off. Okay. Yeah. And was there a, a, some sort of formal relationship between IFAC and IEEE in any way? Uh, no, but uh, the American Control. A squared, yeah. C squared, yeah. uh, Certainly. They, they are the NMO, American NMO, and of course IEEE. I've linked in with them, yes. Uh, link, linked yeah. in with them, yes. so that's a sort so of through an intermediary there is. Yes, a, okay, yeah. yes, okay. And I guess the other thing that occurs to me, you have some very productive collaborations in Europe. Yes. Were they as a result of you spending a lot of time with IFAC or was it before that or? Uh, that's a, Nothing uh, to do with that? No. Um, if, if I look at the three greatest collaborators mm. that I think I've had in Europe, and I've had many, yes. and, and some have been very substantial, but the three greatest were Mohammed Mansour mm. at the uh, Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Zurich, yes. uh, Michel Gevers mm. at uh, Catholic University of Louvain at Louvain la Neuve, mm. that's the French one, yes. and Manfred Deisler at the Technical University of Vienna. And all three uh, arose independently of IFAC okay. and probably started before IFAC. That having been said, the IFAC secretariat is located 20 kilometers or something outside of Vienna. Mm. So I was duty bound to go to the IFAC secretariat once a year and someone paid my fare. So it was fortuitous okay. and it helped sustain okay. my relation with, with Manfred. Okay. And on occasions I would use such a trip and go and visit uh, Michel. You can do multiple yes. things on the, yes. one, on okay. the, on the okay. one trip, but with Manfred it worked particularly well. Okay, that's very good. The, um, I guess in, in, in reasonably recent times you've you became president of the Australian Academy of Science, which is the 
equivalent, you know, I guess, in a sense, to the NA National Academy of Science in the United States, which again, if I'm right, you were the first engineer to be president. And that must have been also a fairly interesting period of your life because <laughs> these things can be political and complicated. And yes. Well, um, th there may have been other people with engineering qualifications. I'm not, not sure who, okay. you know, been biologists or something or other. But yes, I was the first sort of uh, genuine um, engineer. Uh, I don't think that created any no hassles problems no. Uh, uh, at all. Okay. Uh, which I'm pleased about, and I mean, it indicates a certain maturity, you might say, yes. of people in in uh, in that uh, academy. Um, of course, in such a role, there are there are challenges, and one of the challenges that um, that I thought uh, we faced was a general low interest by the federal government in funding of uh, R&D and a sense of disenchantment in the government with universities. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, also the minister who looked after higher education was not particularly close to the prime minister and uh, the way government in Australia works, as, as I'm sure you know, is that some ministers have the ear of the prime minister more yes. than others. And, and that's you know useful if you can convince this minister of uh, of the merits of a particular course of action. Yes. Yes. Uh, so, I, so for me, the biggest issue when I was president was um, trying to do something about this. And uh, fortunately, as a president of the academy, it is a kind of an entree, and it's fairly easy to meet ministers. And I was also, I had been previously a member of the Prime Minister Science Council and I knew a lot of these people. Mm. And as president of the academy, I was ex officio a member of the Prime Minister Science Council. And uh, that was a great platform. Mm. Now, there were a lot, a lot of bureaucrats who shared um, the view that the scientific community had about the government's attitude. There were some ministers who were very sympathetic and so it was a, a, a task of building a consensus um, to try to do something about that which really happened through the Prime Minister Science Council and the funding for the Australian Research Council was doubled mm. in about um, 2001 I yeah, think, well, and um, nicked the money was found. And so yes, so yeah. they were significant achievements. Well, they're not all due to me. No, of course not. Uh, of course not. But but uh, I was um, certainly part of that part of that process and worked very hard on it. Yeah. yeah. And you also uh, founded and were the founding CEO of NICTA, which was a very large. Uh, research centre in the in the ICT area that also supported signal processing control. Yeah, yeah. So that was uh, quite an important development for control and signal processing yeah. research in this in Australia. Yes. That's for sure. Yes. Yes. And um, have you, you know, have you got any reflections on being founding <laughs> and CEO of Well, NICTA? the reason, the prime reason why it had to exist, I think, is that. Government labs in the ICT area were not doing a great job. Mm. And insofar as you can make uh, international comparisons, the universities weren't doing a great job in the computer science area. And mm. It's better in communications, but computer science was, was pretty bad. And um, there were tensions among the ministers and, and differing views with some of them thinking this was serious like the defence people don't like this at all mm -hmm. and the education minister thinks everything's fine and he doesn't want his portfolio interfered with. Um, so anyway the government decided that they would start a new national laboratory with distributed campuses in ICT that it would interpenetrate the universities uh, where there was some excellence mm. in the universities to help get the organisation going faster 
and to help drive the educational side of the enterprise. Yeah. And so, in contrast to almost all other government labs in this country, it was set up more on the model of uh, INRIA or CNRS in France or uh, the Fraunhofer Institute or mm. um, that sort of thing in, uh, in uh, Germany. And um, I was part of the process that um, helped the government come to the view that there should be such an organisation. Mm. They ran a competition. Uh, as you know, there was a consortium of universities yes. at one time. Uh, your university was a member, dropped out and later joined, fortunately. Yes. And uh, we put together a bid and yeah. won the bid. It involved me being CEO. I don't think it would have been successful otherwise because I was kind of a trusted figure. Yes, yes. And, uh, but I put a limit on it of a year. Okay. And I had to do it in Sydney. Yes. And I didn't, I, I found it very difficult to operate out of another city which was not my home with my wife back in yes, Canada. I, can I never want to do that again. I have great respect for politicians yes. who can travel to Canberra week after week from Perth or Adelaide. must be horrible. Yeah. Anyway, that's Nectar. Brian, you, we talked a bit about your engagement with, uh, with Boeing and industrial stuff from Stanford and Boeing and many other cases that you didn't talk about and also your government engagements. But do you want to talk a bit more about, because I know you've had many industrial engagements with Cochlear well, and many other companies. So perhaps I can mention two of the, the most interesting. Um, so Cochlear Corporation is the world's major supplier of implanted bionic ears. Yes. They go in people who are maybe born deaf or have some serious problem. It's not one that's addressable with conventional hearing aids. Yes. Uh, so the company supplies, I'm guessing at the moment, 70% or so of the world's. I think, I think they've done 300,000 yes, worldwide. And, yeah. and it, it is worldwide. Mm. And so uh, it's a, an enterprise doing wonderful things. Yes. And it does them also very well. Mm. And the people associated with them, like surgeons and nurses and the patients, in the main, they're all very nice mm -hmm. people. And uh, I met many of these people. We'd have board meetings abroad. Uh, I don't think I ever went to Africa, but I certainly went to South America, North America, and Europe and Asia mm. with um, some board meetings. And this was a wonderful experience, which I did for 10 years. Yeah. And I was with the company from the day it it listed. I'd had an earlier involvement with predecessors of the company okay. for about seven years prior to that, but it listed on the Australian Stock Exchange yes. and then I went 10 years, which is kind of the use by date. Yeah, I hadn't realised it was that long. Yeah. It's quite an involvement. Um, so the other one I was going to mention was called a Pangea. Okay. And um, a group of people had the vision that Australia would be a wonderful site to provide a repository for high level uh, nuclear waste. Okay. And uh, that's because of the geological stability of Australia. The fact that uh, these highly ge geologically stable areas are not economically productive. You know, there's mm. desert, there's virtually no towns near some of them. There's yeah. a huge area of Australia like this. And uh, part of the vision was that there could be safety in the, in the transportation and that uh, Australia had a stable political system. Yes. It was also possible once you'd put this stuff in there to effectively seal it all up so the incredibly would be difficult to get it out again. And uh, there was, at least at that time, about 70,000 nuclear warheads uh, in Eastern Europe uh, that were tempting targets to underpaid former <laughs> Soviet Army officers and yes, uh, of course. N nasty individuals of no. all shapes and sizes. Um, so, you know, whatever you think of a nuclear power, this seemed to me to be a worthwhile uh, yes. thing to do. 
And uh, the company was headquartered in Switzerland, but it, it set up an advisory, scientific advisory board, US, Japan, uh, UK, Swiss, and uh, I was mm. one of these, there were several Australians on it. And, um, but the Australian government uh, at the time saw too much electoral liability in even engaging in a discussion. Okay. Which is a shame. Yeah. Yeah. I understand governments take these decisions, and but I still think it's a shame yes. because I think the world would have been a better place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, mm. That's very yeah. It's intriguing. Mm. It's intriguing. It um. It it might be a good time to talk about some of what some of the things you think about the future of control. Yeah. You you talked about NICTA with computer scientists and systems and control engineers is bringing together ICT space. What do you think about the impact of computer science on control systems? In the at various times, people have talked about computer science will sort of take over the control domain or the ubiquitous sensing and all these sort of things. It, doesn't seem to have happened and there seems to be a lot of exciting new things to do in control theory yeah. but certainly computing is playing an increasing role have you got any thoughts yeah, about yeah, this? yes well I think there are lots of points of contact between computer science and control um, you know machine learning yes um, the notion of doing things on a decentralized basis event-based yes. control is sort of a semi Yes. computer science notion. On the other hand, it's pretty rare for you to hear a computer scientist using the word feedback yes. or using notions of dynamic systems to characterise yes. you know, what's going on. A computer scientist is more interested in whether the algorithm will terminate than whether uh, the algorithm will give you a series of values that converge exponentially fast to, yes. to um, wherever. Um, I think it's the case that uh, once you get into uh, serious applications, uh, you generally need uh, a collection of skills that you'll almost never find in the one person, and it will be common in applications, whether they're in health or control of water systems or uh, operation of automatic freeways or uh, automation with optimization of traffic light systems mm -hmm. and managing braking, yeah, all yeah. this sort of stuff. One is going to need a mixture of control people and communications people and yeah. um, computer science people, uh, no, no question. Uh, I don't think there's any danger of computer science taking over uh, control, or uh, maybe danger is the wrong word, but I think no. that's that's unlikely. Yes, uh, unlikely uh, to happen. Um, I think there's control future in part is driven by potential areas of application, and you've got go governments worrying about health and aging mm. and environment, and the environment thing includes smart grids and transportation and. Automated highways and that sort of stuff, and uh, and then you've got c companies worrying about um, collecting masses of data so that they can better market, which is, I guess, a form yeah. of, of feedback, and and companies thinking about um, putting little sensors into everything, yes. whether, you know, whether it's a bridge or a yeah, yeah, exactly. car keys or, or or what have you. So it's ubiquitous, but uh, often hand in glove with communications and computer science, yes. talking about control. Yeah. Mm. No, I think it's an exciting era for control too. And it seems to me that the huge body of knowledge that's been built up over the last 50 years about feedback and the nature of yes. feedback and how yes. is, is the great gift that control brings yes. to many disciplines and yes. it, um, my feeling is it's not fully harnessed yet, yes. that gift. Um, um, people outside control, I think, 
um, find it fairly easy to grasp the concept of feedback. Mm. I mean, you can describe how a temperature control system works yes. in a room. But when you move on to the notion that feedback can maybe destabilise mm. and oscillation and all that sort of thing, yeah. in other words, the dynamic side, it becomes intellectually far, far more complicated. Yeah, I think that's right. And that the control people, of course, are across that Sort Perhaps of computer science courses should have some control courses in them too. <laughs> <laughs> I won't get into that <laughs> no, idea. and uh, it's been a fascinating uh, discussion, Brian. Have you got um, have you got any advice you would offer young researchers? I mean, I suppose particularly control researchers, but young uh, young people venturing into well research careers. I think uh, whatever your discipline is. Um, it's great to be passionate about it and it's great to be good at it. Mm. And then if you can try and associate with the very best people, mm. you'll learn faster and maybe become a good person yourself. Okay, yeah. okay, that sounds like uh, very wise yeah. advice. Thank yeah. you very much, Brian. You're welcome.